Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, well, that is a tough act to follow, certainly. Uh, but I will try to do my best. So as, as Alan mentioned, my name is Kano Fresher. I've been working on Julia for about uh, four and a half years now, um, which, you know, almost ready for those jobs that require five years of Julia experience. <laughs> Getting there. Um, so what I'll be talking about to all of you today is uh, gallium.jl, the debugger project that I've been working on for some time. It's actually the third version of a debugger that I've been working on. The first version, some of you may have seen two years ago at Julia Khan. The second version was sometime last year. It was based on LLDB. And then we decided that that was too complicated, and we just rewrite it all in Julia. So uh, that's what this version is. It's up on GitHub. You can use it. I just pushed ch push ch some changes I did last night. So now it also works on the version that got changed two days ago on master. But um, yeah, I'll be, um, I'll be showing it off. And I uh, promised some people I'd take out some of the more advanced and experimental features, because those aren't ready yet. But the, I'll show off the basic stuff. And if you want to see the experimental stuff, you can come see me at the hackathon. And I will certainly show you. Um, before I get started, a couple of people I should acknowledge. Uh, so this project was uh, funded in part by uh, BlackRock and the Moore Foundation through sponsor sh uh, sponsorship of my employer, Julia Computing. And uh, so much for that. All right, with that in mind, I'll quit PowerPoint, because who does PowerPoint anyway, and jump into a terminal. Uh, all right. OK, so uh, what you have to understand about Gallium is that it's not just a debugger, but it's a framework that basically exposes several different debuggers uh, based on the context. And what that means for you if you're debugging Julia code is that you generally are in one of two debuggers under the hood, but most of the time you don't realize. So the two debuggers that Gallium uses when debugging Julia code are um, uh, basically a native system debugger uh, written in Julia, which uh, takes the debug information generated by the JIT and you know reads your local variables of your stack frame um, and generally works very similar to how you might imagine GDB or LLDB or any of the C or C++ debuggers working. And the other debugger is an uh, AST-based debugger, which works very similar to some of the debuggers in more traditional dynamic languages, it looks at the AST and steps through it. And what that allows you to do is that it basically tries to combine the best of uh, both aspects. So on the one hand, the native system-like debugger allows you to run your Julia code at basically the speed that you're used to and that you, know, you expect from your Julia code, um, and get backtraces and look at variables when you need to, and set breakpoints and all of that in your natively running Julia code. Um, but then, once it hits a breakpoint or an interesting event, it will drop you into the AST-based debugger for the purpose of giving you all the niceties of that, meaning uh, very precise stepping, so you always know, you know how, how the program is going to behave when you step, which is a problem with a lot of debuggers, especially if they're debugging optimized code, because you know, the compiler reorder statements, and you just jump wildly all over the place. Um, and the other thing is that in the AST-based debugger, you're guaranteed to have available all the variables in the local scope, which you do not necessarily have in the native debugger. And we'll see some examples of that later. So uh, without further ado, let's, let's get started. So the Gallium is a standard Julia package. Um, it's registered, but I need to tack a new version. So once that's done, you can just package.add it. Um, and I will show off first the AST-based debugger and then uh, later go into the, the native debugger. So the AST-based debugger is implemented in a package called AST interpreter, but that's sort of a lower level utility package. And its main entry point, if you just want the AST-based functionality, is the add enter macro. And add enter works in exactly the same way as add which, add code LLVM, right? So you do add enter. And you know, you say, well, which, which function do I want to look at? You 
put in the function call with the values, um, and it'll figure it out. Um, so uh, this is an example that I stole from Stefan's talk a couple of weeks ago. And what we'll be doing is we'll be stepping and looking at the promotion system in Julia, which is something that people are sometimes confused about. Uh, but hopefully, if we step through it, uh, we can find out how it works. So you know, uh, we did add enter. We entered the debugger. Now we are, um, now we are at the debugger prompt. Uh, just another REPL mode, like any of the other REPL modes. To get into expression evaluation mode, you hit the, uh, the backtick key, uh, switches you between uh, the debugger prompt and expression evaluation mode for the current language that your frame is in, in this case, Julia. And it works just like the other REPL modes that you use for the shell mode or the help mode at the standard Julia prompt. So backtick enters, uh, backtick enters, and uh, backspace sort of, yeah. Uh, backtick enters, backspace exits, just as you, as you are used to from the other REPL modes. Um, so yeah, we have expression modes. You know, we can uh, evaluate uh, expressions using the local variables. In this case, I just looked at x and y, but you know, uh, 2y and We'll see some more complicated examples later. But this is a full, full Julia REPL, but with the difference that all local variables that are currently available to the debugger are also in scope for this REPL, so you can compute on the local variables. All right. Uh, so let's do some stepping. Um, the S command steps in, just um, as you would be used to. So now we uh, were above. We were in the plus function, and now we're in the promote function. Um, we can look at it, you know, where uh, x and y are still there, and the two type parameters of the promote function t and s are also there. Um, you have access to all of them, just as you would expect. And you can also see, which I kind of thought was a neat idea, is what exactly what it is about to run next. Um, and that sort of helps you make a decision on how you want to step, um, because sometimes uh, with the line-based visualization, it's not quite clear where it's going to go next. There's some ideas on visualization, um, which I'm not going to go into today, but at least with this very basic primitive, you can you know, try, try to make a decision on how you want to step. Um, uh, so let's go, go one further. We're in promote type. Um, in case we got lost about where we are, we can get a backtrace of all the frames with all the variables. Um, see exactly where we are. All right. Um, sure, let's just keep going. So um, that was the. Uh, uh, this is now in promote rule. So we were up there in promote rule of float 64 in 64, and this is exactly uh, this is exactly the appropriate code. And if we want to, we can open it up in an editor and see a little bit more context. So. Uh, for those of you who read Julia code, you'll, you'll see that this is just the promote rule that defines, you know, if you want to promote a floating point and an integer, the result is just the floating point. So um, fairly simple, but you know, that's, you, I, I hope you get the idea of how you can use the debugger to find out what the code is doing under the hood, even if it jumps like crazy all over the place, which the promote, promotion code does quite a bit. All right. so. Um, a little bit more stepping. Um, it also does the promote rule the opposite way. And as some of you may know, in Julia, you only have to define promote rules one way around. And then it tries both and combines them. Um, all right, and this is, the, this is the combination. So having done all that work, we figured out that if, uh, if you want to promote a float and an integer, uh, we get to a float. And now we you know, convert one to float, and we'll convert two to float. Um, converting one to float is obviously a no-op. Um, but uh, what's going to happen next is we want to convert two to float. Now it says, OK, we're about to run uh, promote type again. But you know, we already stepped through that. So looking at that again is kind of boring. Um, so you can use the nc command to do a lateral step to the next call in the current frame. So rather than stepping in or just stepping line-based, you can step by calls. Um, so we skip the 
second call to promote type, and now we're in, you know, um, convert to to float 64. And all right, finally we have, you know, uh, the promotion result is um, uh, 1.0 and 2.0, and now after all that work, we're finally ready to do some floating point addition, um, which is this function in the library that calls the intrinsic for floating point addition. Now, um, I showed some of the stepping modes. I showed S and I showed, um, I showed NC. There's, there's a bunch of other ones. Uh, most of the time, you'll only need basically S and NC and maybe N. And, but uh, there's other ones. So for example, uh, this one, if you like, really wanted to know what was going on, uh, you could do a step by step of everything that the interpreter sees. So SI or SE will um, be is the lowest level primitive step that you can do. So it won't uh, just do calls, but it'll also do all the variable references. So here it's step two, uh, one of the unbox calls, and now it's going to look up unbox and base, and then put that in the AST, and then it's it's you know we we can this function is very simple, but you know we can. If we actually looked up every single symbol, um, it's going to take a long time. So most of the time, you would not want to use SI or SE unless you had some very specific thing that you wanted to look at. OK, so uh, five minutes later, we finally figured out that 1 plus t uh, 2 is 3. But of course, I do want to assure you that um, all of that complexity gets flattened by the compiler and Julius as fast as ever. Um, uh, also in native code. OK, so um, that was the, um, that was the native. Let me look at my cheat sheet of what I'm going to do next. Yes, OK, sorry about that. I um, wanted to make sure I didn't skip anything. All right, so uh, I'm going to do a slightly more complicated example. Um, I should disable deprecation warnings. It's Julia 0 0.5. We're, you know, it's going to happen soon. Um, okay, so the uh, the example we're going to look at is um, a slightly complicated plot. And when I tried to find, come up with an example, I put PyPlot examples into Google and picked the first thing that came up. So we're going to look at um, we're going to look at how to make that plot using PyPlot. And I just took it off Google. So I think one of you wrote it. So credit to, credit to you. <laughs> um, let me, uh, let me reload Gallium because I disabled deprecation warnings. All right. Um, so we're going to do the, uh, we're going to do the slightly more complicated example. And as I said, still in the, just the AST-based stepping, um, but just to show off some of the more complicated functionality. Um, so the first thing it does is just create a bunch of data. I'm just going to step through that very quickly. Uh, then it creates a pie plot figure, and then it creates a plot. And now at this point, we might wonder, OK, I created this plot. What is this plot? So you know, the, as I mentioned, the REPL you get for expression evaluation mode is a full Julia REPL. And what that means is it fully participates in the display system that Julia has. And as you, can, I mean, as you may remember, we had the plot at the REPL before, which was handled using the REPL display, in this case for my terminal, which is iTerm. It can display inline images, which is implemented as a Julia display. So since, since that's implemented that way, uh, and since this is a full REPL mode, we also get the same functionality of displaying and everything. All the niceties that you're used to from working at the Julia REPL are also available to you in expression evaluation mode in Julia frames. Um, so let's keep going. All right, we added a and history, of course, just a REPL. Um, we added that. OK, now it's going to do a bunch more stuff, but doing that over and over again is a little cumbersome. So you can do, um, you can set a hook of arbitrary Julia code to run before every execution of the debug prompt. And doing that, we can fairly quickly go through and see all the steps of how this graph is constructed. 
um, and see all the things that are happening. So, you know, the previous thing we executed was the Y label of the left axis. So, you know, we have a blue left axis um, doing some repositioning, purple right axis. You know, you, you get the idea. You can step through and at every step see what is the current status of, in this case, the plot. But the same technique obviously applies to any computation you might do, you know, assemble a boundary value problem, plot it, you know, see, visually see at what step of the computation um, things are going wrong. And almost there. Great. OK. So we stepped, uh, we stepped, uh, stepped through this example, and we ended up at the plot. All right, so uh, so much for just stepping through the AST-based interpreter. I hope you uh, got an idea. It's fairly simple. It should be fairly intuitive, um, and you know you can you can do some very nice things with it. Um, so switching gears now, I'm going to talk about the uh, native side of it and breakpointing. So uh, breakpointing, the breakpointing functionalities are slightly more complicated than perhaps you may used to may, may be used to in you know C, C++, whatever, um, because of how many methods a given, given Julia function has. So uh, let's just uh, do something simple. And for all of these examples, I'm going to use the GCD method, because I've been using it as an example ever since Jeff used it as the first test case of the debugger, and it broke <laughs> a couple of months ago. Um, but also, it's a fairly nice sort of non-trivial function that everybody knows what it does. So it uh, sort of works nicely for demo purposes. OK, so we asked Gallium to get, get, create a breakpoint in GCD. And what it did is it looked at all the methods. Um, it looked at all the methods of GCD and said, OK, for any of the methods of GCD and any specialization of any of these methods, I want to uh, drop into the um, drop into the, uh, the debugger. So let's do an example. Let's do an example with the first one, um, and just construct a, a couple of big ins. Um, uh, what you will you what you are currently witnessing is one of the remaining problems that I have to iron out, which is that the first time you hit a breakpoint, it compiles the interpreter. Um, uh, so it takes a little bit of time, but I want to, while that's happening, I want to explain what it does. So um, it set the breakpoint in the native code for this function, just like GDB would set a breakpoint. But when it hit that breakpoint, it hijacked the topmost frame, read out what all the arguments were, and instead constructed a frame in the AST-based interpreter. So right now, if we hit backtrace, um, it's a little more complicated than what we saw before because it does have the native frame. And eventually, maybe I'll hide the, uh, the internal frames before the, uh, the user evaluated code. Um, but for now, you know, um, uh, we're in GCD. And before that, we were in eval. And before that, we were in the REPL code uh, that called eval. And before that, we were in um, the back end task, which. Uh, evaluates the AST that we did in the back end. OK, and uh, one more thing to point out is that, as I mentioned, the topmost GCD frame is the AST interpreter, but the three frames below it are all native frames. But it sort of, as much as possible, h tries to hide that distinction from you. And everything um, that works in the interpreter um, mostly also works in the native frames, with some exceptions, which I'll get to later. All right, so that is that. Um, oh yeah, one thing I forgot to do. I forgot to point something out. And now I lost the reference to the breakpoint. Um, uh, so why don't we start this for one second? So the breakpoints are um, 
the breakpoints are objects that you can manipulate. So um, um, uh, so what that means is so uh, you see all the specializations that it matches. Uh, Gallium provides functionality for you to selectively enable or disable um, certain, uh, certain locations that the breakpoint applies to. So if you only care about, um, you know, if you care about all GCD methods except one of them, the way you would do that is you would set, okay, I want a breakpoint on all of GCD, and then you would specifically ask it to disable the ones, say, um, for big integers. And the thing that I wanted to point out, which is why I needed the reference to the breakpoint, is that um, what it did under the hood was it sort of uh, listened to all the functions that were being compiled. And it said, oh, that function that you're about to compile is, um, is a GCD method, so I better uh, hook myself into that and set a breakpoint there. Because obviously, we're doing JIT compilation. So even though we can specify you know, which methods do we want to have the breakpoints in, the actual physical methods don't yet exist in memory. So it sort of needs to listen to everything that gets compiled and then set a breakpoint as that's happening. So this was the integers. And then if we do the, um, if we do the big ins again, and yeah, you know, second time a breakpoint is hit, it's fast. It's just compilation overhead, which a couple of pre-compiled statements will take care of that, but I haven't done that yet. Um, uh, so there's the, also the, the big end method. All right, so let's get rid of that. Um, just completely disable that breakpoint, and let's do something more specific. So uh, I told you you could disable any of the uh, specializations, but if you don't really care about the specializations but only want to look at one of them, you can also use the more specific um, uh, breakpoint method. Oh, yeah, the network is slow. Oh well. Um, and specify the type signature. And what that will do is um, it'll look through and say, all right, uh, this method is concrete, and I already compiled it, and we already know it's there. So just you know, reinstate the breakpoint that was previously there. So if we, again, do GCD 1020, um, we, can step through, we can step through the integer GCD function. But if we instead were to do um, GCD on big ins, the breakpoint does not trigger, because we selected one specific type signature that we want to break on. And this works on, on methods, but you can also specify abstract type signatures, which is, uh, you know, you can specify, I want everything that does GCD on two numbers. And then if somebody were to implement GCD on, you know, strings or whatever else would be sensible, um, it wouldn't do that. Um, OK, so that was um, One minute? Oh, OK. <laughs> um, all right, uh, then I'm going to skip conditional breakpoints, which are available. And can I get three minutes? <laughs> I, I can subtract from the questions. If you have more questions after the questions, OK. I, I'm going to go through the rest of this uh, fairly quickly. So you can do conditional breakpoints, and you can set breakpoints at files and lines. Um, syntax is fairly obvious. It's also in the in the readme. OK. Um, right. A uh, few, uh, few more fun things to point out. If you are stepping through something uh, that has a macro, um, if you step, uh, step through something that has a macro, uh, you get not only where you are, but you also get the location from which it was expanded. Um, so you see we are in time, and then up there is the macro expansion that time was in. So you can basically step through everything that our time is doing and sort of figure out what's going on. And that obviously only works if the macro inserts line numbers or is a code block. Um, other, other than that, otherwise you just get, um, get that. Um, and, um, sorry for going through this so quickly, but next cool thing 
uh, you can do is that the uh, expression evaluation prompt uses the new Julia parser error messages that are also available for the main REPL. If you go to the Julia parser repository, you can see how to do that. But they're sort of nice. Um, so if you make a syntax error, you get you know very nice ah, network. All right. Um, you get sort of very nice errors. And it's sort of a nice game to you know figure out what is the what is that? Yeah, well, it doesn't matter. It's invalid syntax. What is the most errors you can make in a you know single line of code? <laughs> uh, this is what I came up with, but I'm sure you can um, you can do more. Okay, and I'm going to skip the example after that and go straight to the last example, which is you can also debug generated functions. Which you know, if you always were curious how the hell CXX works. I know I am um, every two months because I don't remember how I did it. Um, you can um, debug that. So let me just, you know, C++, you have to include headers and all nonsense. <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah. That's me speaking at Julia Con Live Coding C++. But, um, okay, so um, you can step through that if you were just to step through it, not the function I want. Um, if you were just to step through it, um, normally you would get this view, which is sort of the low-level view of what the actual AST is because there aren't any source informations. Um, and it's not very interesting, but what you can do instead is Use the uh, use the sg command for step generated, and that will actually step you into the generator of the generated function, and you can figure out what's going on. So in this case, you know, it looks up what the um, uh, looks up what the buffer was. Buffer was standard C out hello world. Um, then it uh, you know uh, creates a clang function. Creates a clang function, which is complicated, but does all the C++ nonsense that you want, and emits it, does some special calling for the arguments, and finally returns the expression that we saw before. And uh, that's how C++ CXX.jl works in about 20 seconds. And I apologize for going over. Thank you.